right. Well, I don't know. Usually I think it's good if I make somebody cry. I don't know if that's, that might not be good. I love I loved Marcy's word earlier, marinate. You know, I like to, a good steak that's marinated really good or some chicken and some barbecue sauce on the grill. But we do need to marinate on the word of God. Amen? You can use whatever word you want. You can put, we need to think on the word of God. We need to meditate on the word of God. We need to read the word of God. You know, whatever word you want to put in there that connects you to the word of God is a good thing. Amen? It's the, this, this thing right here, like, and this, I don't usually use my big Bible. So this, this is my big Bible. This thing, this book, this collection of books, 66 books to be exact, this, this should be the thing we know the most in the world. Like, that's convicting even for me, like, to say that out loud. Like, as a pastor, I, I know a lot about baseball. Like, I probably know more about baseball than I do the Word of God. And I don't know if that's a good thing, right? There's some TV shows that I grew up watching that I probably can quote, movies that I've watched that I can, I can quote verbatim some of those lines, right? Like, someone could say a line, like, it just, it just comes out, right? So, like, it's an indicator of what's inside of us comes out, right? We, we know that to be true, especially those of us who have been around for a while, and I think everybody in here has been around for at least a little while. We know the truth of that, that what is inside of us comes out. One of the things that I, I uh, illustrations I love the most is you take, you, you, you take this uh, bottle, and it's filled with, filled with M&Ms or Skittles or Pop or, or whatever, this bottle, and you just set it on the table, right? And it's, it's fine right here. Right? The, the, you know, whatever's inside isn't that big of a deal. It doesn't matter really what's inside until it gets knocked over. It gets bumped or shaken up a little bit. And then what happens when, when something gets bumped or shaken, what is inside falls out. It spills out. In the case of a pop, it would explode out sometimes, Right? What, what's inside of, of me? What's inside of you? That when we're shaken, when we're bumped, it comes out. Is it, is it the word that comes out when we're bumped and shaken and bruised and battered? Or is it the things of the world? I've, I will freely say that I've had both. <laughs> I've experienced both where I've had, you know, really been filled with the word of God and 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 stuff comes along and and man God comes out it's amazing and it's beautiful and I love it when that happens amen like that's cool it's cool to see it and recognize it in yourself and and to not be prideful but to boast in God who you know you say God thank you for coming out of me thank you for being in me so that you can come out of me like that's a great thing I love it when I see it in other people like you see, man they have every right to be angry and upset and just Jesus is pouring out of them it's such an amazing thing. And so I just, I, I think, you know, all of that came to mind when Marcy said the word marinate. So I don't know if I'm hungry or if uh, I just really love the Word of God. Maybe it's both. It could very well be both. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 tonight. Not going not gonna to speak a long time. Ephesians chapter 4. This is something that, uh, you know, I, 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 you guys, I think you, most of you know I'm, I'm pretty heavily involved in uh, teen Bible quizzing through the Church of the Nazarene. And Ephesians is a book that I've studied myself as a quizzer, and then I've coached it, I think, two other times. I've been in quizzing a long time. I think, I think three, three different times I've gone over the book of Ephesians through Bible quizzing. And this, this is good stuff. You guys ever studied Ephesians? Like Paul, Paul really gets to, gets to work here. And so let's read the first six verses of Ephesians chapter 4. They're on the screen also if if you don't have your Bible. It says, uh, as a prisoner for the Lord then, and that, like you could talk a lot about that just right there. As a prisoner for the Lord. We even sang in in the song, uh, Glorious Freedom, I think it was, that, uh, or no, uh, sorry, The Longer I Serve Him. 
The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, the, uh, I'm singing the wrong verse. There's a line that says, the more he controls, right? Like, he's con- is he controlling you? Are you letting God control you? Are you actually a prisoner for the Lord? And I know there's better language to use in the Bible. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, right? When we talk about Jesus, he's a friend. We love the song, what a friend we have in Jesus. The idea that he is our co, we are co-heirs with Christ, meaning we're brothers and sisters with Christ. God is our father, and that's excellent language. But I do believe that when we start to think that way, we lose this aspect of him as well, that we are a prisoner for the Lord. We did a Bible study a couple years ago that we really got into the language of God or Jesus as our master, right? That we, and, and that language denotes like, starts to make us think about slaves. We are, and, and, and I think in our Roman study, we've talked about being a slave to righteousness or a slave to sin. Which one are you? And so I, I think just even this first line of this passage, as a prisoner for the Lord, like he's saying, this is what I am. I am a prisoner for the Lord. God gets all of me. Whatever I am is his. He can tell me what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And I can't argue because I'm a prisoner for the Lord. And yet, even in that, we recognize that he's not like cracking a whip on us. He's just guiding us and telling us, and we have the joy of following him and walking behind the path that he's laid, that he has laid out for us. That's good stuff. Are you a prisoner for the Lord as Paul is? As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you. Paul urges us. He's urging. He's like, and that word urge is like, like it's, come on, get going. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Not like so. Be, you know, when, when it feels right, be humble and gentle. You know, when 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 the situation is easy, be humble and gentle. No, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Ugh. Ugh. Bearing with one another in, yeah, I can tolerate you. Yeah. yeah. In love. <laughs> like that just, like for me, I, I, and I've, I've, been in, I've been in some relationships that are some doozies with people in churches, with, with friends. Um, in college, there's there was one dude that he and I just, oh, and we were in Mid America together, and man, we were not to each other. You would never have guessed that we were, knew Jesus Christ. Bearing with one another, in love. like so, even just like saying that out loud, bearing with one another, like it, like it releases pressure. I feel like, like, okay, I can't, like, in me, in my humanness, ugh. But when I think about being a prisoner for the Lord, and I'm supposed to bear with everybody in love, patiently, uh, humbly, and gently, like it's not my choice anymore. Right? Like I get to choose, but I've already chosen. I've already chosen Jesus. Right? I've, I've settled the question. We should have sang that song tonight. I've settled the question. It's done. I don't have to think about whether I like you or not. Jesus tells me to love you and to bear with everybody in love. Like, that makes me smile because I don't, I, okay. Okay. That's what I got to do. All right. Verse 3, make every effort, not once in a while, not once a week, not if I think about it, every effort. To keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, 
one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen? Like, (laughs) come on, like, you get the implication of this? Like, right now, we're all different people. We are all our own individual people. We could be married and have a spouse in here. And even though we're connected through the, the sacrament of marriage, we are still our own individual people. And yet there is one Father, one God, who is in all of us right now. That's awesome. Like, that's cool. And we are connected then to each other because of Him. Not anything we've done. Because if it were up to us, <laughs> we see the ugliness in the world today without God. Oh, the church shouldn't be that way, right? The church should look vastly different than the world. One God, one Father who is in and through all of us. I I just keep thinking about the fact that uh, that when the apostles, I keep thinking about the apostles in the upper room and they gather together and they pray and, and, and Jesus has died and, and hey, he spent his time back on earth after he rose from the dead and, and he went to heaven and the disciples, the apostles, were like, God, we are Jesus, we, we want to we go with you, right? We take, take us with you. Where I'm going, you can't go. He's already said that. Uh, you know, and then they're, they're going, you can't come, but I'm sending back to you the Holy Spirit, one, one spirit, and he will guide you. And if we read John, John chapter 16, we'd see all that. And so Jesus ascends into heaven, Acts chapter 1 still, and they go and they pray. 120 people praying together in this upper room. You know, we're lucky if we can get people to pray for a half hour together. Right? We're lucky, we're lucky if we can get people to show up to a prayer meeting anymore these days. And those people prayed for weeks on end. Weeks on end because they knew that the most important task was whatever God had for them. And it didn't matter, right? It didn't matter. I would, I would be willing to bet those first 120 disciples were very much like Paul, prisoners of the Lord. Whatever God told them to do, they were going to do it. And they devoted themselves to the prayer. And Acts chapter 2 comes. And suddenly, something like the sound of a violent wind came from heaven, separated in tongues of fire and landed on each one of them where they were sitting. The Holy Spirit showed up. And He united them. There was only one thing left to do. Go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they went, however God led them to do it. You see, guys, we, we, we can't do that as a church if we're disjointed, if we are not connected to one Father, one Spirit, one hope. Now, that does not mean that we have to agree on everything, every single thing, the way that we do things. But I think as I look around this room and look at every person, at literally every person in this room, we all want people to come to know Jesus Christ. Amen? Come on. We all want people to know the glorious freedom. We all want people to know what it is to have their chains shattered and they know are no longer bound by sin and temptation and evil and the devil. And they have people around them, a church family that can do battle together on our knees in prayer, and we lift up the things that are bringing us down, the things that the devil's trying to use to separate and divide and and beat us up. And we have this unity around one Father, one Spirit, one hope. 
that Jesus Christ and his shed blood washes us whiter than snow. And no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what the devil throws at us, we are united for the kingdom of God. And so I'm, I'm excited by that message. I'm excited by being, being a prisoner for the Lord. And I want, I want to, as I, I, I can hear the angst in Paul's voice, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We've all received different callings, different ways to live out our life in this world. Are you living it out worthy of the calling you have received? What makes your calling worthy? Is it what you accomplish? Or is it worthy because of the one who called you? So if we're going to be worthy of the calling we have received, we need to be worthy to the one who called us. Faithful to the one who called us. And he is gracious and he is loving and he wants us to succeed. He wants his church to march on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Right? He, he absolutely wants nothing more than for people to come to know him intimately. And he chooses to use us. And we individually have responsibilities, and we as a church have a responsibility to do what God is calling us to do. And that's, that's to bring people into the kingdom. To introduce them to Jesus and then let Jesus do the work, right? Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the reading of his word. People will come to know Jesus Christ if Jesus Christ is flowing out of us. Oh, I'm going to share a verse that I shared this morning in Bloomfield. Adam, uh, Romans 15, 13. If you wouldn't mind throwing that up there. Romans 15, 13. This is just a great, great verse. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Do you trust? Do you trust God tonight? Do you trust him with everything that you are? With everything that you have? With your, your belongings? That, that seems pretty easy. I think I could give up. I think I could give up anything that I own if God asked me to. Like, I, I'm not saying that in a, in a braggadocious kind of way. I, I really believe that if I felt God telling me to give up my car, my, my clothes, money, I, I really believe that I could do that. Is God calling me to give up my, my time? I love working for Jesus. I love it. So that one, that one's pretty easy, but I still find myself burnt out sometimes. You know, uh, finding finding excuses to kind of get away because I'm feeling selfish. What what if God's asking you to trust Him with your family? That's some of the hardest things we do. I, I I'm looking at. A, a room full of parents who have probably dedicated a lot of children to Jesus Christ, into the family of God, and say, God, I give you my son. God, I give you my daughter. <laughs> I still remember this, a, one, a lady from my, my home church who uh, she, she dedicated her oldest daughter to Jesus, and then she got into my youth group, and she told her mom that God was calling her to be a missionary. <laughs> She didn't want to pray that prayer anymore, that, God, I give you my daughter. And she ended up being a nurse who, who did do some missionary work, and, and every time the mom was terrified. But every time I got the opportunity to say, hey, you gave her to him. You gave her to him. Do you trust God with your life, your stuff, your family? And if we do trust him, do we trust how he leads us? I think that's big. 
And so may, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. We've got to trust in him to get the hope and the joy and the peace. So that, and here's the good part, so that you may overflow with hope. <laughs> How cool is that, right? Like, bad stuff happens to Christians. Amen? You've all experienced some hard things in life. Bad stuff happens to non-Christians. They're experiencing bad things in life right now. They need to see the hope that we have. And the only way they see the hope that we have is if we overflow with hope from the God of hope who gives peace and joy by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, guys. Amen? Are we overflowing with hope right now? I, I tell you what, I, it, it, God started working on me yesterday. Uh, during the day, I was, man, the last Friday and Saturday were hot. And it was hot today, too. I was outside. I was building, helping build a deck Friday and Saturday. It was hot. And God just kept flooding me with this idea, this thought, freedom, hope, freedom, hope, freedom, hope. We need hope. I need hope. I can't make it another day without the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen? How do people without Jesus make it through tomorrow? How do they do it? I believe, I, I really believe this, that there, and there's a song that came out when I think when I was in high school, there's a God-shaped hole inside all of us. There is something inside each person, even, even people who don't believe in Jesus Christ, even people who claim that that there is no God out there at all, I still believe because every human being is made in the image and likeness of God, that there is something from our Father inside of us. Just like there's stuff from my dad and my mom inside, there's stump, something from the Heavenly Father inside each and every one of us. And so if that is the case, they have a piece of Him that helps them through they don't know it, they won't claim it, they won't acknowledge it, but they have it. And then when they meet someone who is overflowing with the hope that comes from the God of hope, and things just click and they say, oh man, that's what I've been missing all this time. I want some hope like that. I want to overflow with hope. The only way we overflow with hope, we can't create it ourselves. We need the God of hope to fill us so that we overflow with hope. And then sh that the world sees it. I don't think the world's seeing very much hope out of Christians right now. And I think we can change at least a bit in Sheraton, Iowa to that end. Can we overflow with hope? I think we can. I am, I am filled with hope today. Like God has done a work in me today. I've had joy. Uh, I got to play with my son yesterday. We built Legos last night and today, and God has just used that to like just, mm, feels good, right? I've gotten to sing to him today. I've gotten to, to praise him with my fellow believers in Jesus Christ. And he is here. And I believe he's in each one of you as well. One Father giving us one hope. And now it's up to us to trust in Him so that we may have that hope overflow out of us and into the world around us so people can see it. They can see Jesus in the hope that comes when we give an answer to the hope that we have. Man, I, th I think we should be so crazy with hope that people ask us questions. How are you like that, you big weirdo? Right? Why do you why are you smiling right now? Why why are you not like in the fetal position on the floor crying like a little baby? This world is scary. Like there are people that are terrified of what's going to happen in this world. We have nothing to fear. Because of Jesus. Jesus said to the disciples on the boat while the storm was raging, why did you wake me up? Why are you so afraid? Why are you scared? Because even unto death, for those that follow Jesus, our hope is in eternal life.
That's the message we need to get to the world. That's the thing that we need to get people to see, that this is temporary, not permanent. This is not the end-all, be-all of their lives. But that if they would put their hope in Jesus and they would have an eternal hope, there's nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be anxious about, nothing to be nothing to be discouraged about. And I'm not denying all any of those feelings. We have those feelings because we're human. The devil wants us to stay on those feelings. The devil wants to keep us down with those feelings. And when we overflow with hope, uh, when we overflow with hope, that stuff just gets out of the way. When we overflow with hope because we're trusting in God. All right. So tonight... I'm going to pray here in just a moment, and then we're, we have our, our vote for the, the sale of the building. And let me just give some instructions on that first. What we're going to do is, is uh, you can stay in your seats. We can kind of line up right here, but trying to, trying to still obey the social distancing, coronavirus uh, stuff. We've got, you, we'll have two people at a time uh, go through that door, and, and just right back behind here is a table with uh, two clipboards on it, and you can, you can fill out your ballot, drop it in the box, and then you can uh, come back in on this side, and we will announce the, the results of the vote um, before or uh, when it's over, um, of all, after all the members have voted. We'll announce that in here, and we'll have a, probably just another quick time of prayer um, after that. So uh, are there any questions on that prize? I just want to make sure we're, we're clear on that. It's a simple ballot. Um, no, I know normally we would just pass papers around and you make your vote and we put it in the offering plate or pass it another plate, but we, with coronavirus, we're trying to be careful there. Uh, so that's that's the process. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. I want to just lay out again what we're what we're doing, uh, the practical nature behind it, and then the way that I feel God is leading me. And this this won't take long. The practical nature of what we are facing is that this building is extremely expensive month over month, okay? For the size of congregation that we have, we pay a lot of money in utilities that we probably don't need to. Also, to fix this building is going to take more money than we have and it's going to take more money than we would have if we added what we have to the sale of the property on Highway 14. We still wouldn't be able to fix this building the way that it needs to be fixed. And so with that in mind, the decision was made by the board to allow the building to be put up for sale, and both our church board, local church board, and the district advisory board has granted a unanimous approval uh, for the sale of the building pending the result of our membership vote tonight. Uh, and so that's that's where we're at. Um, the District Advisory Board has uh, placed this church, the Sheridan Church of the Nazarene, as a church in crisis, and that happened uh, two, almost two years ago. And so uh, we don't have a lot of options short of an influx of a lot of money to say to them that, that we need to put money into this building. They would have to approve that. And the reality is they look at statistics and history of not just our church, but churches that are in similar situations to ours and have been over the last however many, however many long years that they've studied this. And churches in our situations typically close a lot more often than they rebound and survive and thrive again. So they would be looking at, if this building were to close, to sell it anyways in a matter of years, however long uh, our church would, would continue on until it was closed. So that's, that's the practical nature of where we're at. What I believe God has directed me in goes back to Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. I think that God wants to do a new thing here. I've said this since I've been here. Marcy has, I think God has, has spoken to her about some of this as well, that we 
want to do a new thing. God wants to do a new thing, and we want to be behind it and a part of it. And we want to do what God wants to do. We could continue on doing this the same way that we've been doing it in this location, and, and we would last however long we would last. And God could do a miracle and could, could absolutely turn things around in this location. What I believe I have heard from God about is that that hasn't happened, and I don't believe it's going to in this location. I believe a fresh start is needed, and that's where I have felt led by God to bring us to this point after being here for a year and a half. So, here we are. And, and I love you guys. I do. I, Rachel and I have felt loved and welcomed and supported beyond belief here. And I know Adam and Marcy feel the same way. We love being here. We don't want to lose anything about the connections that we have with each other. And so, we leave it up to God. Amen. To speak to each one of our hearts. And I believe that God has spoken to each and every heart in here. I believe that he's spoken to hearts that aren't here tonight about the direction that the church needs to go. And I, I'm not going to tell you one way or the other how God's speaking to you. That's not my place. My place, my job, is to tell you the way that I think God is leading me to lead this church. And let's see if we can be unified by the blood of Jesus Christ and do something amazing here in Sheraton. Amen? And it wouldn't be us doing it. Amen? It's, it's God 100%, no matter what. And so that's my prayer, and I'm going to pray before we go. Um, if I could have, Marcy's going to go back, um, and she'll, she'll run the table back there. And then when we finish, um, Phil and Sherry, could I ask you guys as board members to count the votes? And then we'll report uh, after that is over. All right? Any questions at all? Okay. And then I'll, I'll let Adam pick a, a marching song <laughs> as we vote. Heavenly Father, God, I believe this, this moment in time we're at right now, this is a big moment. And I, I don't want to be flippant. I don't want to be too, too light with it. But I believe that we've, we've done what we need to do in, in speaking about the situation and praying about your direction. And Father God, I pray tonight, in this moment right now, that your Holy Spirit would lead each one of the hearts of those who are going to vote tonight. God, this is your church. This is your family. And we just want to be obedient to you, Father God. And if you have a future for us, if you have a plan for our future that includes hope that great things are once again going to be in store for the Sheraton Church of the Nazarene, Father God, I pray that you would just fill us up with that hope, a hope that is overflowing, that we would see that in each other, that we would not be discouraged when we look at each other and say, oh, it's been so long and, and nothing's changing. Father God, that this is a moment in time where we can just begin to see it in each other's eyes, that you are doing something in my heart, you are doing something in their heart, you are doing something in everybody's heart, so that we can be unified to change Sheraton, Iowa, for the grace of God, by the grace of God, for the good of your kingdom. Father God, we love you. I think everyone here agrees on that. Father God, we want to see people come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, and the salvation that comes through his shed blood. We want that, Father God. And we will participate 
however you lead us to do that. Father God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Marcy. And as you are ready, you can go. I get two people at a time to go through the door, and then uh, like I said, we'll announce the vote um, as soon as we can. And uh, so just come on back in here and relax. All right? Whenever you're ready. Uh, in accordance with manual paragraph number 104, um, a vote to sell the church property has to pass uh, two-thirds, pass by a vote of two-thirds um, by the present members. And for this year, we did receive uh, permission from the district advisory board due to the coronavirus to allow those that um, didn't feel comfortable in the group setting to come on the day of only to vote. So we had a few votes that were cast that way, but 21 ballots total. We had 18 in favor of voting for the church to sell and three no's. So that is more than two thirds. And so uh, we will proceed forward with that. I will let the district know uh, where that's at and what we have decided here tonight. My call for us, as I said last week, was to let the vote be the vote. Let's trust God that he has spoken to each person in here. That God is going to continue to speak to each person in here in order to bring about his kingdom, the advancement of his kingdom in Sheraton, Iowa. So let us pray, and then we will be dismissed. And if anybody wants to talk uh, afterwards, I will, I will stick around for as long as as needed. So, Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your presence in this place. I don't, I don't know if anyone could handle the, the heaviness of what we are discussing and what we have voted on tonight without your spirit. So, Father God, I pray that for each, each person that cast a ballot today, God, that you would work. Work in every heart, Father God. And that you would get the glory from this even if we don't understand how that's going to come about, even if we don't see the possibility of that, Father God, that you would get the glory from tonight, that you would get the glory from every decision as we struggle together, as we work together to walk in your ways and in your steps as you lead us, Father God. Bless the Church of the Nazarene in Sheraton, Iowa. We love you, Father. We need and love each other. And God, I pray that you would just continue to unite us in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>